to add. Yeah, uh, nice to see you all. And hopefully this will talk will be interesting on the basis of the last one. Um, so I'm, I'm a geographer and uh, so I'm coming at it from an interest, a long-standing interest in mobility data and, and also uh, re with relation to health. So um, I'm gonna cover a couple of uh, projects that we've been working on the last year and a half including one on mobility data. So I just thought in case people are not fully aware of these sorts of data sets, but they're increasingly common, I'm sure this is sort of uh, all, all very well known to a lot of you, but you know, when we're talking about new forms of mobility data, we're talking about these large samples passively generated with spatial and temporal characteristics, often with individual level uh, data um, or metadata that can be derived from. Uh, from the individual trajectories and um, we can analyze these over large scales you know with uh, tests to, to explore to say spatial and temporal variation the sorts of things that uh, we're talking about are you know your smart cards your oyster cards your tr bank card transactions bluetooth mobile phone signals facebook uh, um, data and google data that we already just talked about um, but you know there are lots of issues with these data, so I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, instances of where we've used them. But I mean, there's so many holes. I think uh, um, I don't think we should be sort of, to, as a geographer in me. I have to feel I have to you know really just recognise the social scientists in me. I really have to recognise some of these the issues, um, and we also have to be uh, mindful of the risks and the risk of privacy um, when we're using these data. So the two projects I want to go through. Um, uh, uh, and I might spend a bit more time on the first one, just given the sort of interest from the last talk. Um, what, the first one is on household visitation um, in response to COVID-19 policy, and that's using GPS trajectories from apps. And the second one is looking at healthcare worker movements um, uh, within hospital uh, environments using routinely collected data. So both of these are granular, large, involving spatial and temporal characteristics. I should also say I'm, I've, got a, I've also got a strong interest in agent-based modelling, and I know this 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 session is also meant to cover some of the modelling, which I'm I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't included um, much of. But I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for building these data sets into into models, into simulations, and I'll touch on that a bit as well. So the first talk, um, the first bit I want to talk about is our work on household visitation. So. Uh, you'll be aware that there's been varying uh, policies on um, household mixing during um, COVID-19, during the pandemic, ranging from uh, support bubbles to the rule of six. Do you remember all these great terms? It brings back brilliant memories. Isn't it? The Christmas bubble, overnight stays, um, they, were, they were all in and out at various times. And there was a lot of discussion about policy adherence and fatigue, um, but without much evidence. Um, aside from um, surveys, which we all recognise have uh, issues with um, biases from desirability biases, social uh, self-selection biases. So there's been no sort of systematic analysis of visitation to other households and, um, and variation over space and demography and, and time. So that's what we've set out to do. The data set we've used is um, data from Cubic, who are a, um, uh, a company who derive, uh, uh, who collects app data from apps um, from consented participants who have apps installed on their phone. The data is collected, um, um, made available on their, their own, um, uh, what's it called, workbench. And, um, and it basically uh, enables you to um, work with the trajectory data, but not like, extract anything which relates to individuals or uh, anything at a fine scale. So it's sort of like a, 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 a sort of an area where you can work, but obviously avoid um, or keep, keep within some ethical bounds, which is quite useful. Um, so we, we were able to basically analyze trajectory data, but extract data, the outputs on an aggregate scale. And um, so I've given a, a, a um, sort of, sort of a, this, this sort of um, distribution is the sort of thing you might have for an individual. I've completely made up for, just for full transparency, that's completely made up points that I've drawn on, on PowerPoint. Um, but it gives you a sense of um, what you might have for an individual. Um, 
in terms of uh, any sort of data set like this, where you have a cluster of activity around the home location, a cluster of activity around a work location, and a number of other clusters of, of, of points um, over time. And the, the, the granularity of the cubic data is such that uh, you don't, you can't really analyze anything very precisely in terms of a route. Um, you know, we're not, the data is collected much less frequently and um, really dependent on the device, not on that, on the phone moving. Um, so we can, we can analyze longer term um, activity, changes in activity and movements to different, different locations. And for this data, we have about a million users between uh, the 18 months of analysis that we've done. So to extract a household visit, what we've done is, is, is fairly simple um, uh, approach for a fairly standard approach is use DB scan clustering to identify home and work, uh, to identify visit points, and then to identify um, home and work locations of the most frequently visited clusters. We've then removed any, um, any visit points that intersect with a point of interest according to which is the definition of the ordinance survey. That point of interest could relate to a bus stop, could relate to a shop, could relate to um, many features in the, you know, many different features. Um, and we also removed any visit points in green spaces. So what we've done there is actually very discriminatory. So we've actually removed a lot of activity and uh, that will become quite important uh, later on. So the remaining points are validated as visits to households or residences by ensuring they're within a 50 meter buffer of address space locations. And then the remaining sort of 11% of, of, of locations, state points, um, I guess, in fields and so forth. Um, I know that's green space. Um, and anywhere else have been removed. So what you end up with is a again this is just fake data but you what you would end up with is um something that looks like this where you've got a classification of a home and a work a another visit point which intersects with a shop point of interest so that again that's ex excluded and then another point uh, a set of activity which is a, which intersects um with a residence and, and doesn't intersect with a point of interest or green space and that's classified as a household visit so once we have our indications of household visits, what we do is um, simply calculate the proportion of um, users within uh, a region of aggregation. In our case, we've used uh, local authority districts to identify the proportion of um, users who are undertaking a household visit that day. Um, we then calculate, we calculate this for different time periods. So we've calculated a baseline, like in the same way that Google and Apple did during the first eight weeks of 2020. That's got its pros and cons as well. Um, and then we can also um, aggregate upwards, uh, aggregate our local authorities to, you know, um, to uh, larger regions such as England, for example. Um, so, um, and then obviously aggregate over time periods as well as we see fit. So what we've constructed are, um, yeah, yeah um, a uh, as an index essentially of the the, um, the the amount of household visitation occurring in a region um, at any point in time. Okay. So if we look at this over time, we can start to see some of the interesting patterns coming out. So um, we've got our analysis period for March till um, May, or, 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 or well, discounting our um, baseline period is March to May uh, 2021, or March 2020 to May 2021. Uh, the gray um, gray areas are lockdowns, and um, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with the timelines. But um, you know, obviously, we see uh, prior to the lockdown, we see a large decrease in the amount of household mixing occurring, according to our data. And then it's slowly increasing over the course of 2020. What's interesting is that, that some of these, um, many of the, the policy changes don't have a significant effect on, um, uh, on, on on the on the change of behavior it looks more like a sort of steady increasing regardless of the 
uh, introduction of the support bubble policy or the relaxation indoor mixing that occurred in July or introduction of rule of six. Um, uh, so, you know, there seems to be sort of um, a degree to which policy has a limited effect on household visitation. And then we also see in the second lockdown um, a reduced reduction in visitation than relative to the first lockdown, which probably twines with a lot of our own experiences of how well that was adhered to. We see stronger reductions in uh, around Christmas, probably likely due to the stronger uh, uh, regulations in around London, Southeast. And then we see, you know, a sort of lower level of activity around um, in the third lockdown until we get to about mid-February. And it's interesting because this date here, where we start to see the ramp up of activity, coincides almost exactly with the date at which um, the vulnerable, um, I've forgotten the right terminology, but the first groups of um, uh, uh, vulnerable people were to be vaccinated, so the 14th of, of February. And after that, we just see continuing increase in activity in household visitation um, through to the actual relaxation of indoor mixing uh, on the May 17th. So this also can be broken down by uh, over space. Um, we can look at over, over, over the whole period. What we see is um, some areas with higher levels of, uh, generally higher levels of household visitation. London is very, stands out clearly. You can look at it over different time periods as well, different lockdowns. What I said earlier about um, how we excluded some visits from our analysis um, and being quite discriminatory there, we actually probably are underestimating the amount of household visitation in, occurring in urban areas due to the fact that where a house overlaps with a point of interest, um, we we're not encountering that as a household visit. So that that's you know going to be the case where there's a shop underneath the, uh, a house or or a block of flats or where there's a bus stop outside the house. And these things are more likely to occur in denser areas. So um, we're um, we've been quite discriminatory there. And then we can start to see, um, yes, clusters of just a bit more confirmation of the trends you can observe here, um, which show that, that London is um, standing out as a sort of uh, continuing to see household visitation. We can obviously break this down by different regions. We can look at um, uh, Leicester, for example, differentiated from Liverpool. Uh, Leicester's an interesting example because you had. Um, uh, extended lockdown, which did seem to have an effect, um, but then there was all the, sorry, the, the orange line here shows the Leicester trend and then the grey line is the national average. Um, and then you see a uh, sort of almost over uh, compensation of, of activity um, after that relaxation of that, that local, local restrictions. Whereas in Liverpool, you know, they had a continuing issues with cases um, and um, various uh, and additional uh, measures, um, protection measures that went in in September. And you can see that activity was basically stayed very low compared to the national average um, during, uh, during the last part of 2020. Um, just to sort of emphasizing the effects from the, what's happened in early 2021 in terms of um, uh, the effect of vaccine rollouts in different regions, um, the data that we only able to get the, the vaccine data on a regional, uh, uh, yeah, regional level. But essentially, you know, we see so what we'd expect is that as vaccine rollout did increase, so did the visitations to households in those regions. Um, and just to head off a couple of questions, representativeness, we did test for it. The data is pretty representativeness, a representative, um, in terms of the population, where the distribution of our users are, um, this this work, this you know, at, at local authority level, um, we're seeing um, pretty good, um, uh, yeah, pretty good representativeness um, uh, with with a sort of slight oversampling in southeast and London. Um, although at MSOA level, we sort of reduce, we see a re sort of too many. Um, regions with no users in them. 
And then also, just to also, because we also mentioned Google later, Google obviously provide um, different lower types of activities. So they, they, were, they were looking at you know, retail, grocery activity, parks activity, transit stations, as well as residential. Their residential data is relating to an individual's own residence. And so what we have is something quite different to that. Um, so you see at the bottom here, the res their residential level obviously increased uh, as um, you know uh, during lockdown, whereas we've got something obviously um, different. Um, we also see interesting correlation, or look, not correlation, you know, um, similarity um, at least between um, uh, uh, the, the, the household visitation activity and retail and, and visits to, to other shops as well. Um, including this slight increase as well in, in activity um, after uh, after the sort of vaccine, the initial vaccine rollout has taken place. So I think what this work does is add something new to the discussion around, um, around policy and adherence, and uh, also emphasizes some of the spatial and temporal variation in those, those policies. Um, and um, I think um, there's a lot more we could do with this. We've been working quite a small team, actually, and so um, I'm interested to hear about anyone else's interest in this project because you know we can, can keep going actually with it in terms of our partnership with Cubic. Um, there are cautionary notes, you know, and, and it's sort of touched on right at the start. These data are only indicative; they're not descriptive necessarily. In motivation, they may be biased. We're not quite sure of the biases either. We, we lack demographic data from users. Um, but um, I think the, there's a lot of uh, scope here for, uh, for, for, for further work. Um, and also, as I said, I think there is, there's a role for these data in um, models, certainly for informing visitation rates in, in any model. I, I'm, I'm biased towards agent-based models, um, but uh, I'm sure any model <laughs> would be happy to include, uh, uh, well, maybe, maybe it'd be interesting to hear how other people have modeled um, household visitation in, in, in in other models. Okay, let's see the time. Okay, so 15 minutes. Okay, so I'll try and do the, the next one's much more, um, much more, uh, uh, less developed, I suppose. Um, but I think it's interesting, uh, potentially, hopefully interesting, uh, different approach. What we've done, uh, what we've done in um, UCL Hospital is a project where we've been looking at healthcare worker movement. So healthcare workers obviously been at big risk of catching COVID and also um, transmitting it to patients and colleagues within hospital environments. And our study has involved um, both the testing of, of staff and the tracking of staff around the hospital um, in order to develop a sort of better picture of nosocomial transmission within UCLH. And um, while we wanted to do something using new novel mobility data, um, we included specifically Bluetooth beacons and, and tracking at fine scale within the hospital. Early in this pandemic, it came very clear quickly that we would never be able to get access to the hospital. No, 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 no one really would want to go and put in beacons anyway. So what we've done is create a sort of fairly interesting, oh, it's interesting um, framework for collect, uh, using routinely collected data um, and to look at um, healthcare worker movement. Our bigger questions are about who's out, who's at risk, what working practices and environments create risk from transmission, and even estimating where and when transmission occurred. But we're still quite far from there. I just wanted to show you some, you know, really just give you the overview of what the data is and what it looks like. Um, and hopefully we'll have some results, interesting results in a few months' time. But um, they, the, the, the data that we've, we've collated um, really revolve around the staff, as I say, um, and for staff we've collected data on their interactions with patients through electronic healthcare records. So we have um, only the um, data on the uh, staff member, but we can, we can, by combining these electronic healthcare records with floor plans, um, which is an extremely, in, uh, yeah, well, manual uh, tracing job, um, we were able to identify uh, interactions down to bed and uh, bed locations, um, obviously with a time uh, a time stamp as well. We can also combine that with um, card access logs, so where staff have 
enter doors and different access points and the times as well. We can validate this with the roster data, so the roster roster time, um, uh, the, the rostering uh, of staff. And then all of this comes around uh, as sort a of central index of electronic staff records. Um, and this is connected to um, staff testing data as well. So this data wrangling job has taken the vast amount of time for this project, and, you know, unfortunately to an extent, but um, we're, we're now getting there in terms of some of the analyses, but it's very early days actually. But what I think is just useful to sort of show um, what we can extract is our figures like this, you know, temporal variation um, in terms of um, door events, patient contacts, um, and what we've broken it into is four different periods, a baseline period prior to um, prior to COVID, and then the first wave from March to July, uh, the lull in the summer, where there was a sort of degree of normality returned, and then a second wave uh, in the winter. And what we're seeing is, you know, um, quite, quite, uh, some interesting variation in, in the amount of door activity and amount of movement between different parts of the hospital and the amount of patient contacts. Um, we can start breaking this down by, by ward, um, observing differences in COVID wards, um, such as this one and this one, um, relative to others. Um, we're beginning now to look at interactions between different wards and how people move between different wards as well and how those, those wards are. Um, yeah, interactive. This is the sort of thing you you know we'd extract from a spatial point of view. Um, these this shows the sort of regions from a card access point of view. Um, we've now improved it with this uh, with these electronic staff records, but you can see that we end up with um, uh, levels of activity in different parts of a of a of a, of a floor in this case, where. Um, yeah, the, these areas obviously more highly populated than the sort of smaller areas, um, but uh, it's all this is all just as I say indicative of of, uh, of what we can do with the data. We started breaking down by staff variation. So um, again, this this shows um, door door activity, so um, access events, and you can see that the, this is also broken down by the different periods of, of the analysis. So the red dot is the baseline, the blue dot is the um, first wave, the green dot is the summer lull, and the purple dot is the second wave. So we're still trying to interpret this data, but um, you know, we, you know, I think at this point, it's interesting the fact that we can start to see the porters and the cleaners and the estates teams do move around more. They, they visit more doors than you know than, than doctors and nurses do, which is at least um, a face validity for, for, our, for our data. And then we can also look at this in terms of um, patient interactions and we see uh, nurse, nurses and healthcare assistants much more in terms of uh, higher levels of, of interaction with, with patients. So this is this is now where we're going towards, and this is extremely early work. But this was using some of the uh, testing data was to to model um, the uh, uh, the the factors that might result in someone testing positive um, based on the two weeks prior the, 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 their their movement behaviour two weeks prior to the test to the positive test, and we've taken a um, a. Uh, Dags approach to this, but um, you can start to see some of the things that occur, which may, which are interesting and sort of confirmative of some of the other trends uh, we've seen in other papers. So that BAME staff are a uh, higher risk of testing positive. Um, there's the, the occurrence of, of higher numbers of COVID patients is again another factor. Um, and then we start to see other interesting things, and you know, like like the fact that people on, who are working night shifts are also more likely to test positive, and people who are seeing more unique patients also um, seeing a higher likelihood of, of a positive test. But these are you know, early indicative works, and so I wouldn't take this as red. But I think it's just quite um, you know, just just really this this bit of work is to show that what, what's possible really. So. Um, so yeah, I think I think is I think the point is we can use mobility trajectories to highlight 
behaviors in hospital contexts, almost taking a, a mobility um, data point of view to a smaller scale uh, context. And they can provide indi indications of, um, of different types of behavior, although still questions out are outstanding about the production of the data, the interpretation of data. We've been on site, we've done our own observation studies, but we still do lack some of that insight. And we are linking this, this data to simulation, so we're actually building a COMP-B model of um, social distancing within an agent-based model. And then I think we're in an opportunity obviously, to add in um, um, other data. But I'd also, I'd also, you know, this disclaimer is that, you know, we spent a lot of time getting even to this point. Um, so they say data science is 80% wrangling data and 20% analysis, but this has been more like 95 to 99% um, wrangling or paperwork. Um, but uh, so if anyone's interested in, in this data and uh, has ideas, we can we can sort of, sort of talk about uh, collaborations as we it's, it's quite an interesting case anyway. So uh, there's some acknowledgements on the left, um, the, the, the RAs have been involved and the projects, um, as you can see, MRC, SRC, EPSRC, this is very multidisciplinary stuff. So um, I think that reflects what the approach we're taking. So thanks. Thank you very much, Ed, for a really, really uh, good presentation. Um, uh, now, I've got to look out for any hands, but we do have a couple of questions in chat. I don't know if you can see them, Ed, but the first one was from Samuel Brand. Um, he says, I've seen similar trends, for instance, drops in mobility slash visitation after measures than slow return towards or above Feb 2020 baseline. But measures fatigue is also debunked. So how best to understand the increases, Ed? So, draws and I think the prob yeah. problem here is that I put the question in before you had a slide up saying that this was like a next question, a next thing you want to answer. So I'm sorry about that. I guess it's the million dollar question of uh, which you kind of put up a slide immediately after I put the question on, go like, we can use this data to try and understand this question. So yeah, so sorry, I skipped to the end of that. Apologies. That's okay. okay. Yeah. Um, well, thank, thank, thank you then. So um, it sounds like you were a little bit hasty there, Samuel. <laughs> um, uh, we, we've got something from Gavin Long here. Uh, did you identify any correlations between increased household mixing and the number of COVID cases in areas? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, this is the, this is all we not we haven't done actually, and this is the thing we we do need to get on and do. We, we it's a bit of a um, uh, capacity issue on the project, to be honest with you. And uh, and this is a, I think there's a lot of things we could do in terms of demographies as well and um uh, i think yes there's basically a whole piece of modeling we could do still but we haven't done so um no is the answer all right thank thank you ed um right so um before we break for sort of tea and coffee break do i have any more questions i can't see any hands raised unless maha can see them and i can't but um no i can't see oh ed Hopefully, yeah, just a brief one. I guess just on that operational side of things, I mean, thank you for that. That was a fantastic talk. And so just at the end, talking about trying to build in like the combi model mm -hmm. framework and then obviously the interdisciplinary nature of everything, it's yeah. in terms of like, I guess, developing, building the team to be able to bring together all these components. I was wondering if for your insights on just how long that's taken to have like the relevant expertise to get to that point. Oh. And I guess maintaining that, I suppose, maintaining <laughs> that too. Yeah, that's been very interesting. Um, so um, we are a really diverse team on the Safer project. Um, so it's involving. So Susan Mickey is one uh, leading um, from a uh, sort of a behavioural point of view. Um, then um, there's uh, infection specialists from UCLH. Is us who we do geographers. So yes, it's it's been um it's been interesting. So we're still working on the combi model. Um, I think, um, yeah, I don't know what the I don't know what 
the right answer is it's, it's challenging um i don't know um <laughs> challenging sounds very appropriate <laughs> yeah i don't know it's, it is challenging but it's really rewarding i think people you know i think what's been interesting for me is as someone who's coming out from a mobility data point of view um and you know agent based modeling point of view is taking that sort of um those sort of data and that sort of approach to the hospital has been interesting because people are just like oh wow didn't think about it this way which sort of which is very rewarding you know and um i'm always waiting for someone to say oh no you know this is this is not this is wrong um you know for this reason this reason that you don't understand and and uh, but but no i think um there, there definitely is opportunity for, for different you know novel approaches to using different data and, and modeling approaches in, in those contexts and um and yeah i think it's, it can be can be quite beneficial. I hopefully it's going to be beneficial. I think some of the some of the results we're starting to get out of the data in particular is quite are quite interesting. I think there's it's a long way to go still. Thank you, Ed. Um, we are now into tea and coffee break time. Um, so I if if we can maybe just take one more quick question if there is one. Otherwise, um, I would like to suggest that we all have a break now and resume at uh, two fifty five with our next talk. And I'd like to unashamedly plug um, our next event, which is on uh, optimal vaccination strategies. Um, this is a Juniper linked event again. It will be running on Tuesday, the 14th of December. Um, and if you look on our website, you'll be able to find it. But I think perhaps my colleague, uh, one of my colleagues will drop the link into the chat for you. There it is, Claire, she's so efficient. Um, so please do register away if that would be of interest. So thanks again, Ed. I can't see any more questions. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you.